Good morning, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency. Um, I have to say just a couple of words, if I may, before I introduce the panel. It was 17 years ago when I first met uh, His Excellency Amar Dabar. And uh, a more impressive person I cannot remember meeting in my life um, for his uh, commitment, determination, and sheer humanity. And what we have seen in the last few minutes, the 127 cumulative award winners of the STARS Foundation, 24 here today. Uh, it is more in terms of a life's work than any of us could uh, uh, believe possible. Uh, Amar has been absolutely a fantastic example. And I have to add to that also Muna. Where is Muna? Muna, would you stand up, please? Uh, Muna has been there from the beginning of the STARS Foundation. I was a very early trustee of the Foundation. Uh, every time Amar had a vision for what the Foundation could achieve, uh, I said uh, behind the scenes, of course, I wouldn't say directly to Amar, but I said behind the scenes, no, that won't work, Muna. You have to, you have to get him to um, reduce his ambitions to something manageable. And she would come back and say, sorry, we tried, but still he insists on taking this global uh, next week. Um, and so, of course, we did our best. Uh, it's vision, it's determination, it's a sense of humanity that uh, is represented by uh, His Excellency. That's the reason why we're all here today. Now, we have uh, a distinguished panel. Well. To be honest, if I can speak confidentially, it's not quite as distinguished as the first panel. But it's pretty distinguished. And actually, like Avis in the famous car advertisement, we're number two, so we're going to try harder. <laughs> okay. So from, uh, from my immediate left, let me just very briefly introduce the uh, panelists. So f first of all, we have uh, Rakesh Rajani, who is with the uh, Ford Foundation, and he's director of democratic participation and governance at uh, Ford Foundation. Uh, and then we're uh, honored to have next to him Susan uh, Rockefeller, who is the founder and CEO of uh, Protect What is Precious. Um, may I call that a cause marketing type organization, or is that not quite correct? It's cause marketing, but more importantly, we partner with businesses and nonprofits to create content, whether right. it's films, co branded content, collaborations. So. Excellent. Okay. And then uh, next we have uh, uh, my old colleague from Harvard University, uh, John Ko. Dr. Ko is the founder and uh, CEO of Edgemakers uh, and also chair of the Institute of Large Scale Innovation and has spent his whole career working on complex innovation management. Uh, and then next to him is Saab Eigner. Um, Saab is founder and chairman of Lawn World Group, but in the last uh, couple of years has taken on a very important role as chairman of the Dubai Financial Services Authority. And I might add in addition that uh, Saab and his wife are great patrons of Middle East art and uh, bringing Middle East art to the rest of the world. Uh, so thank you for that as well. And then finally, um, my good friend from uh, China, uh, Mingpo Kai. Uh, Mr. Kai is the founder and president of uh, Cathay Capital Private Equity. Um, he uh, was educated in France as well as in China and uh, has uh, been very importantly responsible for bridging uh, financial investment between uh, those two countries, between France and China. So I'm going to start by asking each of the panelists to reflect on their own journey as philanthropreneurs uh, and what has enabled them to combine successfully philanthropy and entrepreneurship. 
and perhaps uh, reflect a little bit in so doing if they wish on some of the comments of the first panel. So John Kao is uh, going to lead us off. Well, thank you, John. I'm going to uh, start by doing a little bit of framing of the topic of entrepreneurship and then reflect on personal experiences second. Um, it's um, appropriate that we're in France to have this discussion for another reason as well, which is that the term entrepreneurship came into use first in France in 1723. Uh, I wish I could report to you that over the uh, subsequent almost 300 years that we've achieved a kind of definitive clarity about what entrepreneurship is, uh, but there still is a fair amount of confusion out there, so it's worth reflecting for a bit on what entrepreneurship uh, is, or rather what we would like it to be. This confusion I can testify from personal experience. I uh, advised a, a government which, a couple of years ago, which for obvious reasons should remain nameless in this story, where uh, I was advising on the Year of Innovation, which was a big social uh, program, and it turned out that the year previously they had had the Year of Entrepreneurship, uh, run by a completely separate government ministry with completely different programmatic agenda, and the two sides had not communicated. And this is, you know, a little bit of the dilemma that we have today when we speak about entrepreneurs as being risk takers. Well, is that really the case? Uh, maybe it's you take the risk, I'll take the reward. <laughs> Are they creative? Well, if you own 20 McDonald's franchises, you're probably a great entrepreneur, but are you particularly creative? So this, this notion of trying to gain clarity about uh, what entrepreneurship is, I think, remains with us today as we uh, concatenate philanthropy and entrepreneurship to create this new notion of philanthropreneurship. I can speak with personal uh, experience, uh, having been a part of the Harvard Business School Entrepreneurship Interest Group, which spent almost a year trying to define entrepreneurship. And we finally came up with a definition that an entrepreneur was a person who had the ability to mobilize resources without regard for whether they owned those resources or not. So it, it connoted this, this concept of leverage, of being able to make things happen without regard for resources under their direct control. And I would argue that in the present era, and this is a theme that I think came up very powerfully in the last panel, that we're talking about um, uh, exerting influence without regard for the source of the, the resources uh, that, are, that are required. And I can say this also from my personal experience. I'm more on the demand side of the philanthrop uh, philanthropy equation. Uh, Edgemakers uh, was designed from the beginning both to be a venture-backed uh, enterprise as well as a 501c3 uh, tax-exempt organization. And the reason for that was quite simple. We needed to access talent. We needed to move fast. We needed to reward people. We needed a venture capital mindset. We wanted metrics. We wanted to be sustainable. But at the same time, we knew that there were programmatic areas for us. Our mission is to empower young people worldwide who want to become uh, expert innovators so they can make a difference way ahead of schedule. And that, for example, to uh, uh, find resources to support a sustainability, innovation, and social justice uh, effort, we would have to uh, resort to uh, a 501c3 uh, pathway. So I would argue that we're really almost in an era of what you might call uh, a postmodern uh, entrepreneurial philanthropy or philanthropreneurship, where um, these new mutated forms like Mark Zuckerberg's LLC. Uh, these new concatenated, mashed up forms that allow for a combination of public and private and pu uh, public sector interests are really the, the new forms, that, the new mammalian forms that we're seeing emerge in the current landscape. Thanks. Okay, super, John. So, uh, Susan, uh, your thoughts? So, I was just going to say, I actually thought about postmodern and the idea that it takes all different people to come together and it's about collaboration, it's about innovation. And in terms of my own philanthropy, I can give funds, time, talent, sitting on the boards of nonprofit organizations such as Oceana or Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture, or We Are Family Foundation, which actually harnesses the talent and leadership of teens and youth to become the next generation stewards uh, in terms of everything from grassroots organizing, um, all different areas of uh, entrepreneurial activity. Um, in terms of my own work, I would say that being a filmmaker, I use the power of media and the power of social networks. And I think the most powerful um, collaborative partnerships are really in the communications arena right now. Um, 
looking at uh, the power of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what we're doing here today. Um, I use the power of film to tell stories and blend the thought leadership in the sciences and also taking so much information, because I think this information age, there's so much information and in how do we distill it and how do we actually tell a story that actually reaches the human heart. So a lot of my film, film making is about empathy and getting people to really connect to causes that need to be addressed. So whether it's working on food security and ocean health or soil health and food security on the land and sea, I'll partner with scientists. I've partnered with the Ford Foundation for my newest film and other NGOs as well as uh, social platforms such as magazines, Eating Well Magazine, Tribeca shortlist. So I think the power of connectivity and collaboration is to me what really is defining this philanthropeneurship model. Um, we were at COP21 yesterday and there was a lot of talk about trans, transdisciplinary um, fields with healthcare and climate change. So perhaps we'll be thinking about uh, trans philanthropists, trans philanthropeneurs, um, looking at all the various disciplines that are needed. And one thing in terms of uh, looking at the beauty of the images that we saw with the, the star awardees, just the beauty of the faces, the diversity, looking at the diversity of culture, and the fact that, you know, I ask myself when I get somewhat overwhelmed by the enormity of these problems, what are we doing this for? And when I see what the Star Foundation is doing in terms of celebrating the children and celebrating the culture, the diversity of culture, it just gives me a lot of hope. So I just wanted to thank you for this wonderful work. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. I think um, Faye Tversky in the previous panel also referred to the need to focus on beneficiaries. And I was very impressed that the uh, representative of the award winners uh, spoke to the uh, cumulative years of experience working with the children, working with the beneficiaries in his uh, acceptance remarks. Um, let us move next to uh, Saab. Um, you bridge both the private and the public sectors in your uh, work. Uh, different perspectives with respect to philanthropeneurship? Yeah, thank you very much, John. Y yes, and, and, and I would say very much sort of uh, our host, Amr, typifies a new form of philanthropy. He was leading one of the most important government institutions in his country, and he is an entrepreneur, uh, and, and it's how he's managed to take a lot of the private and public sector knowledge and put this through uh, uh, into this wonderful achievements. But I'd say entrepreneurs bring a lot of things other than money, as we, as we all know. They bring energy, speed, and, and speed is something I'm going to touch on in a minute. Uh, expertise, uh, uh, passion, uh, and not, not that traditional entrepreneurs wouldn't. It's just a new way of dealing with things, and I think uh, David Rockefeller uh, earlier distinguished traditional and non-traditional, rightly so, and Malcolm Grant touched on this as well. Uh, and the reason I mention speed is because in the public sector, clearly, things don't happen as quickly as either people in them, very bright, very capable individuals would like them to be, as they would with entrepreneurs who are able to empower much quicker uh, and, and able to do this in a very different way. And I think the, the, the speed to identify needs very quickly, uh, the, the, the speed to solve them in as effectively and quickly as possible, and importantly, the speed to be able to raise money from not only themselves, but from the community in which they're in through new mediums. And I think new mediums are very important, uh, and I touch in on the use of technology uh, in raising money, and crowdfunding is but one of these areas. Uh, and I was speaking uh, only two days ago to a, a, a young 16-plus uh, year old, who I know jolly well, and, uh, and he was telling me two things. One, uh, he was caring for an old people's home, and he's raising some money to help them. And I said, but that's fine. I'll send you a check. And what do you need? He said, no, no, I don't want your money. And I said, why? He said, I'm going to get it from my friends. I said, but 
you wanted 20,000 pounds, and you know, I know you've got rich friends. I said, but uh, how are you gonna get 20,000 pounds? You got three, four friends. He's got, no, I've got 2,300 friends. I said, what do you mean? He said, that's what I've got. And he raised 24,000 pounds in a week. And I thought, okay. So there's a new way of doing things. And I think it's our thinking of how these platforms are gonna be used. And obviously there is room, and I think Malcolm mentioned earlier ethics and the importance of ethics and values, because they can be abused as well. And I think I have much faith in this new generation. Uh, and, it's this, and, and the same thing would happen in getting the views of, of the young. And we chatted last night, and you deal with the young. And we had a small debate that young is not teenagers. So, so there are young, uh, even at, 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 like us, we are all young. Uh, I would say, uh, but it's the, it's the use of speed, and I think speed is going to play a really fundamental role in being able to deliver on philanthropenerships. It's how do you harness it and make sure, as earlier was mentioned, that you have ethics and values, uh, and I don't want to call them barriers, filters, so that you're able to do this in a very positive, engaging way and engagement with the different audience that you traditionally would think of in raising money. So. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mingpo, you, uh, you have offices now in the uh, United States as well as in Europe, as well as in China. Um, contrasts between these three cultures in terms of the philanthropreneurship opportunity? Yes, uh, I'm a, the new generation of Chinese entrepreneur. And the perception of Chinese entrepreneur, it is uh, we are uh, making business all the time. And uh, even aggressively, this is the image of the Chinese entrepreneur. And actually, um, I born in a very poor fishing village in south of China. And 26 years ago, I come to France. After working for a multinational group, I found my own company. And uh, eight years ago, I found the Cathay Private Equity from zero. A Chinese entrepreneur found a private equity firm in Paris. It's very unusual. And uh, today, we grow into 1.5 billion euro in the management. And uh, sometimes, people consider philanthropy. It is to resolve the problem. But my perception, entrepreneur as I am, I'm busy. Because, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, business to do. but. Sometimes I ask myself what it is, the real motivation. The motivation I found in a responsibility. Uh, responsibility could be also a kind of, uh, of motivation because Chinese entrepreneurs, today they are facing a very important challenge about internalization. When you come to a new countries, as I do, I used to come to Europe, then I go to US. If you have only so objective it is making business. I think it's not the best way to make your integration, local integration, the best. And the philanthropy, whatever the form you take, even just sponsor a local basketball team, I think it could be a very good way to make yourself being local. About Cathay Capital, since uh, six years we have our foundation, we translate uh, the book of a very famous French entrepreneur, uh, uh, the former CEO of Essilor, uh, Xavier Fontanet. He say you have to work with the time. The value is in the time. And once the book is translated, even we bring 20 Chinese entrepreneurs come to visit the many French families, Auchan family, uh, and so. And in the end, actually, I show them through the example of all these French entrepreneurs that sometimes growing slowly could be also an achievement. You understand me? China, we used to grow so fast, but sometimes take time to do the thing. It could be also an achievement. Today, we are translating the book of Cai Guoqiang, the artist. Now he's living in New York into French. But I want to show also to French people that we have also this kind of elegance of thought, this concern on to contribute to others, 
And uh, not only this perception, the Chinese entrepreneur, we are greedy to making money. This is for business-wise. So through all this project, you know, my partners, we have Chinese, French, American, German. And through all this project, I make the entire Cathay group team members. We are not only bound by interest, we bond by heart through this kind of philanthropy project. For personal wise, I think, I don't know why philanthropy should not be just to resolve the problem, it should be part of our education. It is part of our elegance. It is something we should educate our children. After Charlie Hebdo events in Paris, in the beginning of this year, my son, who attended Lycée Francais in New York, come to me and say, Papa, you are Chinese, but you started your entrepreneur life in France. I'm Chinese. I was born in Orléans. Why don't we do something to help and the French immigration second generation for integration to the society, the problem of France, it is, because he feel these kind of things. And they tell me to an internship in New York uh, Foundation who do the similar things. And then we went back to Orléans. Orléans is a very small town, south of Paris, in Olivet. And we chose the lycée. At the time, when I, 26 years ago, when I arrived in France, and most of them, it is immigration from Maghreb, Africa, uh, chosen. We chose 12 people through the tutorial system. We take the people from Cafe, they are best educated people, have a business school, Ecole Normal, HEC, those guys, one by one to help them. And I can tell you the first session when all they meet together, the tear in their eyes of those kids. When they are looking for an internship, they never beyond 100 meters of their home, I can tell. And they see people come from Paris. You cannot imagine everything is concentrated in France. In France, it's concentrated in Paris. And the people come from Paris to be interested by their cause, all these kids, it is very touching. So, personal-wise, I think it is also a necessity. Thank you. So, I, I think you have, uh, I think you also capture um, the philanthropy as part of the corporate value system and corporate culture of Cathay, right? Not just at the personal level, but also part of the corporate value system. Exactly, John. It is a necessity. It should be part of the, our business, it is not something additional. It should be part of our, uh, how to say, uh, worry or pre pre uh, preoccupation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, please, uh, let's go uh, finally to uh, Rakesh on the first round. Um, from the Ford Foundation point of view, how do you reflect on uh, philanthropeneurship? Sure, I'll, I'll take us back to the work I was doing before I joined the Ford Foundation in Tanzania. Um, you know, one of the challenges we all face is how do we know we mean well, we want to try to be useful, but how do we know what's going on on the ground? So the organization I used to work for, which is called Twaweza, it's a Swahili word which means we can make it happen. Once a year, we close the office for about a week, and all the staff, from the CEO down to the person who opens the gate for you, go off and we spend time doing an immersion. Now, we know that you only get a limited glimpse. We also look at data and other kinds of ways of knowing very carefully. But once a week, we go and do this immersion. So I'll tell you a story of an immersion I did in 2009, where I went to a place called Kahama in the northern Tanzania, next to a big gold mine. And uh, we stay in the home of our hosts, in ones and twos, not the whole group. So we can and uh, I was assigned to stay at a house of a guy that I was told, his name was Hamisi. Uh, I was told he has a wife, I wasn't told her name, and three kids. And that uh, he was a cotton farmer, and that's all they, basically all they did. And the woman was a housewife, and they had three kids. So I got there, and we spent uh, the first late afternoon talking about his cotton business. I was trying to figure out kind of his profit and loss statement. And very quickly, we figured out that he was probably at best making $200 a year. So I was thinking, this is going to be tough. Uh, how, how can he manage to survive on $200 for a family of five? And that evening when they, we had dinner, 
and the dinner was quite uh, generous with quite a few dishes and so on, I was feeling very guilty that here's a family pulling out all stops to entertain me and probably spending a huge amount of their annual income. So it made me feel very uncomfortable and, uh, and I tried to say to them, Let's, you, know, you don't need to do this. And they said, don't worry, it's okay, it's okay. Um, and next morning we woke up very early and said, you know, we're going to the farm, do you want to come? So I thought, let me go to this cotton farm. But when we got there, he said, no, we're not going to the cotton farm, we're going to the tobacco farm. Oh, so you also have tobacco. Yeah, but you know, we're not supposed to grow tobacco according to the authorities, so we don't really advertise this. And, but we, you know, we make much more money on the tobacco, we get paid and so on. So I did that. And as I was coming back, I met his wife. Uh, who was going somewhere else, and he was, she was going to her vegetable garden, which I got to see a few days later, and uh, she has a thriving vegetable garden. So, okay, so it's not just the cotton, it is the tobacco, there's the garden. And when we were going back, I noticed that the, that the woman, whose name was Veronica, had four bicycles, and she rented the bicycles out to help transport water from the well to the houses around the neighborhood. Um, she also had lots of visitors during the day. And first I thought, you know, these are just friends and, you know, who would come in and chit-chat, but they would kind of come quite often. And I said jokingly to her, you know, you're very popular, you have lots of friends who come. And she said, yeah, well, it's not really friends. I, you know, come, let me show you. And I went into a living room and there, there were two big cupboards. And inside the cupboard, when she opened them, there were matches and candles and cooking oil and sugar and flour and condoms and pencils. And, and she had a little store, a little business. And I said, well, why don't you put it on the road, said, ah, it's, then I have to be there, this way I can multitask, uh, and I also don't have to pay taxes, uh, you know, by doing this business from my home. Uh, and there are many, many other instances of this sort that took place. Uh, I also found out there was a cousin who was part of their, uh, who, who did something that I wouldn't really boast about, but he was part of the local militia that, that uh, ensured justice, and they ex extracted rent of 20% of what the fines were, for either domestic violence or debts not paid and so on and so forth. And then finally on the last day, on my fourth day there, uh, the only room in the house that I hadn't seen, which was the bedroom of the Hamisi and Veronica, a swanky motorbike comes out and, and this guy takes it out and, and this is the local taxi system, he rents it out. So I did some quick calculations again on the fourth day and I realized that he was making a minimum of $200 a week. Uh, you know, probably more, and I think had I stayed there seven days, I don't know what else I would have discovered. I think there are three lessons I took away from that experience, and uh, the first is, is that, like I said, that they were making, probably making much more money uh, than we think, and had I done a household survey and had I spent two hours with them, I would have never known that. The second thing I learned, and I should have said to you that the woman, Veronica, when she served us the meal the first day and when she greeted us, she would go down on her knees and made me intensely uncomfortable. And I thought, you know, here is, look at the kind of gender discrimination. Here's a woman who has to literally go down on her knees. And I thought, you know, all the images that come to me in your mind are about how women are treated. In the course of the four days there, I got to find out, and this is the second lesson, that she really was the chief executive officer of this family. Whenever I asked any complex question, any question around strategy, she was the one who answered. He was the one who referred the question to her, and he was really the, the implementer of the jobs that she sent him on. The third and final lesson is, I think if we mean well, and if we want to help folks like Hamisi, Veronica, and, and her kids, um, we probably would do well to start with what they are already doing. They had amazing business. They had amazing business models. They had worked out, despite all kinds of difficulties, uh, they had worked out a system that worked very well for them. They had used a lot of creativity. They had taken risks. They had hedged on those risks. And I think a key lesson that we took away is that the way to start a program is to start with the insights that they already know. And the program we built, uh, Tuaweze, is very much built on, on that model. Okay, thank you very much for that great story. I think, I think it uh, remind, reminds us that um, um, the greatest examples of resilient entrepreneurship are actually found in emerging economies uh, where the institutional structures are not in place and where people have to effectively be entrepreneurial to survive. Uh, but I want, I want to push back a little bit uh, to the panel on uh, the concept of philanthropreneurship. Um, I just raise a couple of questions which I've heard raised by others and seek your reaction. 
So some people um, perhaps criticize uh, philanthropreneurs for being uh, too uh, meddling in their approach. Uh, and that in some sense they are sometimes undermining uh, institutions, undermining government or allowing government to get off the hook for not delivering what government should deliver. Uh, filling the gaps is a great thing to do, but if filling the gaps uh, means that the people who should be taking care of the gaps are able to uh, relax a little bit too much, maybe not so good. So that's one thing I've heard. The second thing I've heard is that uh, there's far too much emphasis on measurement. Uh, by philanthropreneurs. And this is something that Faye Tversky also mentioned in passing in reference to a questioner, uh, that not everything that deserves to be measured can be measured, uh, not everything worth measuring should be measured. Uh, so what are your reactions to these two uh, points? Anyone like to uh, respond to that? John, would you like to take a shot? Well, meddling is, is only uh, meddling if you assume that, uh, for instance, the public sector has the entire responsibility with a few notable exceptions. But, you know, if you look at education, which is my current and uh, long-term obsession, really, I, the, all kinds of new entrants and new offerings are coming in to disrupt the traditional public sector education system. And there are many choices available to learners that were not available before. Similarly, in, um, in healthcare, you know, the, the private sector and the philanthropeneur class is inextricably uh, intertwined with the traditional um, uh, players, and we're seeing this in other areas as well, in including national security. So I think meddling is as meddling does, um, and uh, it's almost inevitable, I think, that this mutation that we're witnessing today is about the um, arrival of a whole bunch of new entrants and uh, seeking a new equilibrium. Please, Frank Cash. Uh, in defense of the accusation of meddling. So I think the opposite of meddling is not being passive. It's not just writing a check and not caring. Uh, the opposite of meddling is being engaged in a thoughtful way. I think a mistake that many philanthropists can make is to think that they know the answers. Uh, we, you may be very good at what you do. That doesn't mean you know how to solve social problems. I, I think the, what you want to do is be engaged, be thoughtful, ask the right questions, and like all CEOs know, get the best people who are well qualified to engage with the, with the issue. Be curious, be open-minded, be willing to change your mind, ask for feedback, ask for data. If that's what we need, that's not meddling to me, that's just being engaged and curious and thoughtful. Okay. Yeah, I was Susan. Just, just agree with that, that I think, you know, part of any success strategy is having a really good team in place and bringing the best and the brightest from different skill sets, whether it's from the technological side, the science side, the marketing side. So, you know, I believe in meddling, but along with a really good listening capacity. Because I think if you're able to listen and understand what the grassroots needs are, you're better able to implement and work with them, those communities, um, to give them the tools they need to unfold in the development that they wish for. Um, what, what, what about measurement, Susan? Do you think you can overdo measurement? I personally, I personally think you can, especially as a filmmaker and as an artist. I think it's very difficult, you know, and actually with the Ford Foundation grant, I did have to do a lot of analysis and measurement, and it was very, it was a good exercise in terms of how many millions of people have I reached with my film, and um, so it gives a framework to understand impact, but I think, especially in the arts, it's hard to say what the impact is when you see a beautiful painting or you are listening to a beautiful piece of music, and there's a transformative quality um, that I don't think metrics really, uh, they don't quite work. Uh, Saab, comment? Yeah, uh, I entirely agree. As someone who's passionate about music and the arts, I obviously can understand th th that you can't apply metrics on these elements. Although you do need m metrics of type. You, you can't possibly set up something like the Stars Foundation without metrics, by way of example. And I think for philanthropeneurs uh, or entrepreneurs, uh, they give a lot, of, a lot of things, but one of the things we don't talk about is reputation. 
both ways. So they give their reputation, but then you see the risk to philanthropers, to their reputation. And I think the Zuckerberg example is a very good one, uh, that here is someone, an enormously successful entrepreneur, who made a decision to give without realizing perhaps the reputational risk to what he has done. He would not have expected a backlash in the way that it's done. Because assumingly, I don't know him, so I have no idea, but presuming that he's done it with very good intent and what he's done is enormously great and should be celebrated. However, there are reputationalists with entrepreneurs giving in a philanthropic manner. But I think you need metrics. You can't just say we don't need metrics. But there is the soft element, of course, of metrics. And that is, it's, it's how bureaucratic you get. And you reach a point where it becomes negative and no longer productive. So I think you, you need to have some rules and guidelines and regulations. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I just wanted to touch on, on the same point, is that entrepreneurs, by and large, uh, and, and writing the check by way of example, so some write a check, but entrepreneurs are passionate about what they want to do, and, and they want to give, but, but they want to influence the way that is. And in some institutions, this doesn't work. So I think where it doesn't work, you just have to let it be. Either you write the check or you walk away. You need to do it in a way that both sides want to both accept the money that you want to give in a format in which is plausible to both. And I think that's very important, particularly for institutions such as academic institutions and others, or, or scientific or health institutions. An entrepreneur can't say, well, I'll give you, but do the following. You're giving to support what is being done. And I think this is quite different. You may give sound ideas and, uh, and give a lot of expertise. But I think to give it and dictate in both in, in health, like Malcolm's, or education in universities, is not necessarily always the right thing to do. Right. Uh, so stewardship in the new model, stewardship from the point of view of the recipient organization, uh, becomes a little bit more challenging perhaps, but shouldn't be overly onerous to the point of uh, undermining the ability of the recipient organization to deliver on its mission, right? Now you mentioned uh, um, the Chan Zuckerberg gift, and we have a polling question. Uh, you now see it in front of you. Uh, and I think the way to think about this is, do you think it's primarily primarily uh, classical philanthropy number one, philanthropreneurship number two, or tax management number three. And remember, you're voting anonymously. All right, that's what we love to see in marketing research, a uh, dispersion of the results. Um, so uh, who on the panel would like to uh, react or comment on uh, the results here? Susan, thank you. Well, I would say that uh, number two is what I would have voted for. I think it's great that he took 99% of his wealth and is applying it to Philanthropy or philanthropeneurship, I think the idea of the LLC uh, and being both innovative in investments will be really interesting to watch and monitor. I think there's a lot that he can be doing from a risk standpoint in terms of investing in technologies, clean technologies. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what, what he's going to do and actually who he brings to his team to implement what he's going to do. I think that will be the most interesting to me. Right, that should be very revealing. Uh, Ming-Po first and then John. Yeah, it, it, is, it is really amazing because uh, after his announcement, so many Chinese people in the social media think uh, I hate this tax management. And so he wrote personally in Chinese, he speaks Chinese. Uh, to answer all these questions. I think a philanthropy and entrepreneur, in a new generation of entrepreneur, it, could be a, it should be a concept. It is uh, just a natural thing. Because when you do entrepreneur and the philanthropy, you still consider marketing expenses and so. But once you make really a good philanthropy project, you 
engage your entire company and every single team members. When you feel good, when you meet the entrepreneur, my team, they feel good, they smile, and the entrepreneur feel you are joyful, I can tell you the ambiance is not the same. Maybe you make a deal done. So in certain way, it is so naturally have uh, this kind of concept, and I love your title, Reinvent the Frontier. The in new generation, today the frontier doesn't exist. When the earth just appears, no one say here is France, here is the US, here is China. As myself, I travel in three countries every month. In, in the end, you reinvent the frontier. So I see clearly one thing can go through to bond the heart of every single people together. It is philanthropy. And they make everyone feel we are united and bonify yourself. So I think it is very natural kind of things. And the philanthropic partner, you, you engaged and you are involved. You are involved, not just to give money. Two quick comments. Uh, first of all, I think the, um, um, uh, the really intriguing part of the LLC forum is that it allows uh, the effort to both lobby uh, and also to invest in private companies. And if we go back to your notion of trans uh, philanthropeneurship, which is another mutation here, <laughs> Um, the big wicked problems, education, security, health, whatever, what have you, are a combination of government, private, and public sector. So he's giving himself the flexibility to be able to be influential in all of the, uh, or in most of the relevant sectors as opposed to giving money to uh, tax-exempt uh, organizations that can receive the funding. The other point about this tax uh, issue, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the U.S. tax code, uh, the $49 billion write-off is against adjusted ordinary income. And even Mark Zuckerberg, I don't think, can figure out how to create $49 billion of adjusted ordinary income. So the so-called tax benefit is not really a big tax benefit at all. And actually then in the LLC form, when he sells any kind of appreciated assets or donates them, the tax consequences would be the same as if he had done it through a more traditional philanthropic vehicle. So the, the tax issue is kind of a, a, a non-issue, a non in my uh, uh, partially educated opinion. Well, I, I don't think it's quite a non-issue, uh, but, but you're right. Once, once it's transferred, the, if you want to transfer it out of the LLC, there would be full tax implications. Look, what we're saying and what he's saying is essentially, I can use this money better than if I had paid taxes, that the government. So, how do we know that Chan Zuckerberg will use this money better than the government would have? It's not a trivial question. I think we need to think about that. I'm, what I'm really grateful, I'm, I, and I think he's a smart guy, I think one of the best things that has happened is that he, as some of you will know, he really got very invested in New Jersey school systems, trying to reform those. And I think those who know him will say he's both burned and and uh, has gained a lot of humility from that experience, that things are not as easy as they seem. And I'm hoping that the fact that he went through that experience will at some level uh, allow him to be smarter about how he spends the money. Another example, and, and I hesitate because Sonal Shao is, is in the room and worked with Google, and I, you know, there was great excitement when Google announced its philanthropic arm in a different way, Google.org. And I think most people agree that at least in its early years, it didn't do very well. It did very poorly, and many of the kind of excitement that there was there about this new approach that when Google was really cool, you know, seven, eight years ago, didn't fall out. So as long as there's a huge dose of humility, I'm excited about this effort. What, 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 what do you think, um, and you know, maybe David at some point might comment on this as well, what, what do you think these mega philanthropeneurship gifts do longer term with respect to the role of the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation and so forth. Um, how will you continue to be relevant? Um, it's, uh, it's good for us to know our size. You know, Ford used to be the biggest foundation. Now we're number two in terms of traditional foundations and, and, and get much more. Uh, I think we need to learn that the problems are big and we can only achieve them in partnership. As big as these mega funds are, they still are small compared to what government spends. So as people mentioned in the first panel, I think how we engage with governments to transform government is, I think, going to be really crucial. And I do think that it's good to kind of have the cobwebs dusted every now and then with, with different perspectives that come. We, we already collaborate. You know, there's an East Coast, West Coast thing in the U.S. around philanthropy, and there's much more shuttling back and forth between the two sides. And I think we, we're changing. We're beginning to change uh, in how we think. Okay. 
ne ne uh, next topic, I've got to move on. Um, COP21, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we have another slide, I think, that we can put up on the uh, screen for our audience. So, should be on the front line to achieve the new global goals, yes, 89%. Um, I'm not sure about the 11%, um, but they're out there somewhere. Um, next slide, in addition to that, which will frame our next question. Okay. Uh, so, there is, um, I th is it 17 or 18 SDGs? Can someone remind me? 17, right? So, the, the, here we have the uh, split in terms of which sectors do philanthropists uh, invest in globally, and obviously you could check more than one. Um, what I want to do is to ask each of the panelists from their point of view as philanthropreneurs, uh, which of these sectors look to be the most likely to benefit uh, from the philanthropreneurs' initiatives? Or are they all equally relevant to uh, philanthropreneurship? Bit of a tough question, but uh, can someone help start us off with any thoughts on that? Rakesh, you sure. have the overview, if you like, from uh, your perch at Ford Foundation. So at some level, I think the real question is not whether you do health or education or environment, it's how you do it and what's your role. So I'm, I'm, I'm evading the question, but I think the more important question is not which box you tick, but how, how, how you engage with it. I want to emphasize one point that's a little different, which is we've had a lot of debate and argument around what should be in the sustainable development goals. We have 17, and if you look closely, the, the 17 has many more things in there, and that's been criticized. Um, but putting aside this debate, how will we know that we're making progress? And if you ask that question seriously, which is a, which is a measurement question, but it's also a question around strategy, you realize that the quality of the data we have on, on the basis of which we make all kinds of conclusions is shockingly poor. Anybody who clearly is, is, we often don't know what we're talking about even when we just talk with great confidence as to what's happening in health or education and so on. So the entire data infrastructure I think needs a great deal of attention and the good news is that what we can do around that today because of technology, because of how we've learned lessons from mistakes in the past is huge. Uh, and that involves both the old-fashioned stuff around administrative data that ministries and governments and local governments collect every single day, to surveys that, and the bureaus of statistics. You know, I, we often don't celebrate bureaus of statistics, but they probably are, you know, doing God's work. You know, those are the real saints, and, and they need help to get that right. So there's the old-fashioned work, but there's also the new opportunities that the technology discussion in the first panel raised up. You can now collect data much faster, you can mash it and aggregate it and analyze it. You can share it. You can visualize it. And that's not only cool, but it allows us to understand things at a level of complexity and depth uh, and with quick feedback in a way that's really powerful. I'll give you one quick example, again, of the work I used to do where um, Traweza runs Africa's first nationally representative and scientifically rigorous mobile phone survey that allows us to both get opinions as well as know what's going on on the ground in real time very quickly. So typically a survey that used to take one to two years and cost one to two million dollars, you can now do on this infrastructure with equal rigor in about a month and for about $15,000. So imagine the possibilities of how that quick feedback can help you reframe the debate, know much better what's going on, try something and know whether it's working, working or not. And, and, and I think that's, that's what, what governments can do but also the new entrants like the technology companies, the mobile phone companies have a, 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 a huge space. And the, I want to underline what Sonal also did, which is the huge break we can make now is get citizen data, citizen feedback, right from the ground in a way that's really powerful. And that's going to be crucial in the new data architecture. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else on the issue of uh, SDGs and COP21? So, Susan, you were there, right? Yeah, I would just say that um, being there for just one day was uh, information rich and um, statistically, you know, again, like the whole idea of how you analyze and use the vast amounts of information that's available. We were at one panel where there were many different people looking at 
health issues and climate change, and one organization had 60,000 scientists and a, just a lot of different people, and I kept saying to myself, how is this actual information going to make a difference? And I do think there is so much of it, and how do we distill it? And in terms of sort of overarching um, thoughts, I think about the sustainable development goals, and my hope is that you know most businesses and governments it will not be sustainability, it will be that is the way business is done, that we will have a lens through which we will look at um, the issues of water and climate and be much more responsive. I think uh, there are really wonderful leaders uh, in this field that are looking at philanthropeneurship in the corporate sector. Uh, Unilever, I would point to as one excellent leader. Um, so my hope is that we get more people uh, collaborating because these, cl these issues are so complex and uh, the suffering will be so great if we don't address climate change in terms of, especially uh, in terms of food security and water security. Mm -hmm. uh, John? What we're talking about here comes under the heading of what uh, the literature calls wicked problems, uh, problems that are so complex that they seem virtually insoluble. And one of the principles of addressing wicked problems is that you have to get everyone under the same roof. So inclusion becomes important. Technology becomes the answer. Crowdsourcing, uh, crowdfunding being, you know, obviously uh, one uh, important innovation that has occurred to enable the voice of citizens, the bottom upness of it, even the voice of youth to be heard in ways that can feed back into the decision making process and also create not just a dashboard for trying to understand complexity. I mean, you parse any of these wicked problems, you get hundreds uh, of thousands of players. How do you make sense of that all? Well, that's, a, that's an open question, but digital technology can help as well. And then finally, it serves as a, a medium. Uh, so the power of storytelling to affect change. You know, I mean, we, 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 we need speed. Why do we have speed? Well, because we're gonna uh, go for an IPO maybe. I mean, that's one motivation. But the other is because we have a sense of urgency because the problem is a mortal problem that if we don't solve it, we're gonna be in deep trouble. And so imparting a sense of urgency to a critical mass of people through the power of narrative, again, is amplified by these kind of bottom-up dynamics and by, for the first time, having these kind of digital media that allow everyone at the end of their mobile phone to get an answer and to achieve alignment and to express opinions and to be included. You know, if these, if these big goals are just discussed at the level of the command module somewhere uh, in a privileged environment, it's not gonna trickle down and it's not gonna affect behavior at the grassroots and then we will just have more great ideas without uh, great execution. So one, one implication of that is whether um, in the, the new world, uh, a philanthropeneur should be guided in terms of the way he or she uh, allocates the funds according to what democratically the beneficiaries say they should be allocated to. How would you respond to that? Well, I think, I think you have to take all of the uh, sources of information you have at your disposal with a grain of salt and ultimately use judgment. But I think that, and I think crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, bottom-up dynamics mediated by technology are a very new kind of uh, methodology. So, um, I, you know, I would use good judgment and uh, analyze all the sources of information and then make as informed a decision as possible. I don't think there's a linear correlation yet between what the crowd says and what you should do. Okay. The wisdom of crowds, uh, you right. think, is overrated. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to take one more and then go to the audience uh, for some questions. So Mingpo, did you want to comment or Saab on this, both of you? No, I want to come to T1. Yes, yeah. yes, I, I, please. I'm a deeper belief yeah. uh, of execution, uh, no only strategy. So uh, Cafe, we join uh, about a 12 uh, French uh, private equity firm and uh, we make uh, a public uh, statement. I think it will be published on Monday. Uh, to commit, not ourselves, but all our portfolio company. Look, uh, uh, a firm is us. We, we have 50 portfolio company and uh, uh, present uh, more than 5 billion euro revenue. And uh, we want to have uh, a very detailed chart. And uh, they are going to follow this kind of guideline. I believe really execution is much more important than strategy. Okay. So, thank so you. I just wanted, I wanted to touch on what you mentioned earlier on data, and I want to come back just very briefly as I close my comments on speed as well. And, and I think, uh, and, and Zuckerberger, I mentioned him again only because it's topical, uh, 
is I, I think for entrepreneurs in the technology sector have a really very important role to play, much more than writing a check. I think being able themselves to almost leapfrog in speed terms, and particularly in data mining and management areas, where they, they have the capacity even more than governments, uh, and they have the entrepreneurial spirit, call it DNA, call it whatever you want, to be able to put it to better good and work with very important sectors. And I'm not surprised, actually, at, at seeing health being one of the key constituent parts. But imagine harnessing all of this with technological entrepreneurs who have the ability and have the data to be able to very quickly help in really transformational ways. And I think speed, I think I know what speed is, but I'm much slower, much, much slower than, for example, my son in talking about speed. So when I talk to him about quick things, he's already, I'm way behind. And I think we just need to understand that speed is a contingent contagion effect. But I think technological entrepreneurs have a really important role to play, particularly in areas of, of data uh, mining and management areas. Uh, let, let, me, let me just ask you one quick question, uh, since you are chairing the securities regulator in uh, Dubai. Um, so what, what uh, obligations should the securities regulator place on listed companies to deliver on these goals? Well, I, I think it's a very good question, and we're dealing with two things. One, the crowd one that you are mentioning earlier, because these are new areas that are unregulated. So you, you now, we haven't had a major problem in crowdfunding yet. We are going to have a blow up and we are going to have issues and people are going to say, why aren't these regulated? So innovation is all well and good, but when it, there are absolutely no rules or guidelines or regulations, there are, very, there are very real, in real terms, risks on ethical and value standards that we touched on before. And you know, so it's a, a very big area. And one doesn't want to stop it, because you, if you stop it, you're not an innovator, and you're not engaging with innovation, so you're a problem. But these things need to be really understood, but they're going so fast. Just as we think we understand them, they just keep moving ahead. And I think that's where technology companies have a real role, and a social corporate sense role, to be engaged in this area, so that we're not seen as barriers as yeah. such. Just one quick sentence. I mean, I think we can't have this conversation and not talk about the regulation needed for how companies like Facebook and others use data. I think there's great promise, but there's also potentially great harm. So we really need that. Thank you. All right, good. So let, let's see if we have some uh, questions from the audience. Now, I see some thrusting hands. Um, I want to give you my well-known internationally acclaimed definition of a question before we start. And that is a single sentence that ends with a question mark, okay? <laughs> now, if I want those of you with your hands in the air to reflect on that definition, and if you feel that you cannot meet that standard to lower your hand at this point. Okay, I see several have gone down, that's great. Um, I'm I, I see some, this is the way to play this game. There's a gentleman in the middle who sort of half got his hand up, which means he's very nervous about making a mistake. So we're going to go to him. My, my, my question is around actually uh, managing expectations. Uh, we, we talked about risk uh, and uh, an impact measurement, but how do you, you need to manage expectations about the outcomes or the impact of, of projects to make sure that you, you don't address the skepticism or you do address the skepticism that exists today with regard to philanthropy. Okay. So, so, so it's a matter of uh, assessing risk? Well, it, it's, it's a matter of recognizing that uh, many people are skeptic, skeptic, okay. have skepticism. Right. And how do you manage risk and setting expectations? Like in, in the capital it. market, you will have, you know, if you succeed one out of 10 in venture capitalists, it's a good thing. But right. how do you translate that into Right, skepticism, management of expectations, it also goes to uh, the issue of capacity building, and there are many examples of philanthropic support for tests that never get scaled up. 
Uh, how do we manage those kind of uh, expectations? What, Rakesh, why don't you start? Sure. So I think we should you know, not oversell ourselves. There's a lot of hype and spin. I think it's great to have big, powerful goals, but we should tell the story to get there. We'll need a lot of thoughtful incremental change. And as someone in the earlier panel mentioned, you know, a lot of this is going to fail, and we need to speak very openly about every many things we try. Most of them will fail. I would just add uh, patience and perseverance. And um, I think most people that have innovative ideas, they expect that they will have some failure. And to embrace that as something that's part of what can create innovation at its best. OK. We're going to go to the gentleman over here who now has the microphone. Then we will go to the lady in the second row. My question is about measurement. Uh, we talked about overmeasuring. Um, we have been able to measure quite well the effect and impact of our work on the children we work with. When we think about working with children, there is a lot related to education. Our problem is, even though we measure a very wonderful and positive effect of our work, we do not have the strength to convince our governments to uh, make that work sustainable. So my question is, philanthropeneurs who engage, are they ready to engage in lobbying and in advocacy, advocacy work? Are they ready to become activists? Because in the old days, it was said it's not only by bread alone that people are better. Now it is, it's not only with money alone that people are better. Money is not the end. Mm -hmm. then Very nice question. Thank you. Who would like to uh, answer that? So, come on, guys. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think you're right. The data and evidence alone does not lead to better policy change. I think uh, philanthropists can have a really important convening role in trying to get different people to hear each other. Um, I, you know, I've been in many conferences where an activist from that country gets to speak to the minister from the same country and get change happening that way. But I would be a little wary about philanthropists becoming activists. It's more about making the connections so that the people like yourselves can make the case. And I would just say it's great that you are here today and people like us can hear about the great work that you're doing. So I think a lot of it is the connectivity that happens in, in conferences like this where we get information on what you all are doing and uh, the leadership of um, the Star Foundation. You will, by the nature of you taking a risk and investing in these grassroots organizations, it makes it easier for other philanthropists to say, oh, the due diligence has been done, let me take a look. So I'm sure many of us will be going to the websites or trying to get more information on all of your programs to see how we can support you as well. So I think it's the ripple effect. It's both you know, uh, traditional philanthropists that will be interested in the work that you're doing along with just finding ways to partnership with other institutions. Uh, I would just say that there's a uh, certain caveat for philanthropeneurs that your question surfaces. Um, if you want to go into the business of monitoring what I am doing as a beneficiary, uh, in many cases that is getting your feet into the political swamp. So you had better understand that there may be consequences for your engagement in that way. And you may be called upon to either step up or step back, uh, to become more of an activist yourself, uh, to support uh, the engagement that you've decided to um, embrace, or you better stay out, one or the other. There may be no halfway in some cases. Uh, the lady. My name is Albina Dubois-Rouvre. For 26 years, I've been running an organization called FXB International, FXB USA. And I set up at Harvard the Center for Health and Human Rights, which you maybe know. Well, I just, sorry, I don't have a question with one sentence. I have one comment with one sentence, if you may allow me. The, the most important sentence in the SDGs, in my opinion, is not the 17 goals or the text. It's when it says that the programs from now on, contrary to the MDGs, should be made universal and integrated and indissociable. Because we know now from our experience in the field 
that impact and sustainability, which I learned at Harvard with Dr. Mann, is indispensable to really make a difference and a change. So when I see the cake there, I think it's not just to choose one part of the cake. It's to intervene in a specific place with specific people doing interventions in all the cakes plus other parts of the cake. Okay. I think it should be underlined in red because it's the most important framework to work from now on. Right, so ju just remind, uh, remind us again those three elements that you mentioned, universal. Well, universal is what the SDGs yes. want because it's global. We can't as NGOs yes, do yes, it universal. Yes, yes. But the important words are integrated and yeah. indissociable. Okay. Meaning, which I learned at Harvard, meaning that you have to do interventions at the same time simultaneously and you have to do them linked together because otherwise the impact is not as good mm -hmm. and the sustainability is not as good. May I give one small example? You make a school, it's fantastic. You send a child to school, comes back, there's no home to be in, sure. there's no food, okay, no sure. health care, sure. no sure. impact, no so, sustainability. So how do individual philanthropreneurs respond to that? We can trot out a uh, conversation about collaboration again and again, but uh, what Alpina has pointed out is that for maximum impact, there has to be a level of integration that requires a level of kind of complex systems management that is probably beyond most individual philanthropreneurs' capabilities. Uh, so Rakesh, can you see a way of bridging uh, between the individual philanthropreneur here and solving the problems the way Albina is referring to? Yeah, I think Alvina makes a really great point that we life is not lived in silos. People, all these things matter. The question then is, how do you actually respond to that? I think there is all. You know, I mean, just as there is a risk that you just focus on one thing and, and forget everything else, there is also a risk. I think that you try to solve too many things all at one time. So I would, I think, the our experience of one agency trying to solve everything has not been so positive. I think the evidence doesn't really support that. It's more about a perspective. It's about coordination. It's about connection. Uh, and I do think that we need to prioritize. Prioritization doesn't mean that you kind of ignore other things, but you try to understand in the interconnection of things that there is a sequencing and there is a there is a priority. Um, that's really crucial. Excellent. All right. I think uh, we are out of time. I am being given uh, multiple signals from multiple sources uh, that we are done. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, having you um, uh, participate um, uh, with our panelists. I want you to thank them all for their uh, contributions.